In part three of our series, we saw that Paulus had definitely changed and turned against Hitler, and we mentioned his public statements. Now, let us come back to the decisive change by reviewing the Field Marshal's notes in his private diary. Here we can actually see how difficult it was for him to perform this internal revolution. On the eve of the attempt against Hitler, Paulus had received other dramatic information. Captured German generals and thousands of soldiers marched in Moscow in front of the Soviet people. July 19, 1944. Roska said that 20 generals and 50,000 men captured around Minsk were marched through Moscow today. If this is true, then Germany has perished. They waited for me to say something about it, but I remained silent. I did not want to tell them that I was thinking about it. They say it was broadcast on the radio and published in newspapers all around the world. If the Russians get to the Rhine, then England is dead or at least India is lost. England cannot allow this. But maybe the Americans are interested in such an outcome. July 23, 1944. It was announced that there was an attempt in Germany against the Führer. These news reports are not at all clear. Perhaps this is a propaganda trick. But if there really is an insurrection and it were to succeed, then it will be the best for Germany. If it is suppressed, then it will be even harder and Germany will be further weakened. These events indicate the weakening of Germany and the acceleration of its downfall. Today Zeidlitz, after learning about the plot against Hitler, sat at his table, his hands covering his head and exclaimed, My God, to what end has this madman brought our army? That is Balkan manners, an officer throwing a bomb at the commander-in-chief. July 24, 1944 it is difficult for me to express my attitude regarding the events in Germany, since I do not have enough information. If these generals really participated in the uprising against Hitler, then they know better how to act there. From the very beginning I made a firm decision not to take part in political issues while I am a prisoner of war. I do not intend to revise this decision at the moment, in connection with the events in Germany. My upcoming trip to Moscow will not make any changes to this decision I made. In fact, Paulus changed his mind one week later, after he learned about Hitler's reprisals against the plotters. July 26, 1944. Today Colonel Adam, in the presence of von Zeidlitz, announced that he had joined the Officers' League. I took this absolutely calmly, saying that I understand his position, but as for me, I want to get a clear picture of the situation first. August 2nd, 1944. Today I was talking for three hours with Colonel Stern. I told him that this method of continuous pressure applied to me only increases my stubbornness and that I cannot come to any new decision under such daily pressure. This was a milestone for Paulus. Overnight he changed his mind and decided to join the voices that were raised against Hitler. August 3, 1944. Today I told the Russians that as a result of my conversations with other generals and because of the new situation, I seriously intended to reconsider my attitude towards a public statement against Hitlerism. But I need to express it in a convenient form so that it would not be interpreted in Germany as a stab in the back of the German army. It is said that Turkey broke diplomatic and economic relations with Germany. Behind this, one should probably expect Allied landings in the Balkans. August 4th, 1944. Today I went to talk again with the Colonel. I asked him, what changes are expected from my public speech, since the fate of Germany is already written? He replied, your call to the army means the salvation of many German lives, because a man who is known and respected in the whole army, and who raises his voice, shows a way out of a catastrophic situation. Otherwise, it looks like this. 27 generals of the German army say, it is necessary to remove Hitler. He leads us to the abyss, and you, the field marshal, you remain silent. Your silence is equal to a loud call to continue this bloodshed, and this will not be allowed either by the generals or by us. You must say a decisive word.
August 8, 1944. It is difficult for me to write these lines. Apparently, this is my destiny, as if such a sudden change of direction was prepared for me. Today, I decided to oppose the Führer. I still did not understand how so quickly, word by word, line by line, my statement was written. If it really helps at least one person in this world, then it means that I wrote it correctly. It is very difficult for me to think about the fate of Coco, Susie and others, but I still hope that they will be alright. August 14, 1944. Today I made a conscious and correct decision on joining the League of German Officers. I did this because during the last 34 years I was, first of all, an officer. In the evening I gave the Colonel the text of my appeal to the German Army Group Nord to cease fighting. I think that the appeal will find a proper response both from Colonel General Scherner and from his soldiers. As the Colonel informed me, it will be broadcast on radio. August 29, 1944 My friends told me today that at a meeting of prisoners of war in Camp No. 27, when there was mentioned my entry into the League of German Officers and my address to the German people, one of the officers shouted, Schweiner! It was impossible to identify this man. The Nuremberg Trials Paulus as a Major Witness In November 1945, the historic Nuremberg Trials began. The main Nazi criminals appeared before the International Military Tribunal. The Wehrmacht generals and field marshals, who acted as witnesses for the defence, tried by all means to shield their former chiefs sitting in the dock. But one among the former top-ranking Wehrmacht officers did quite the opposite. On January 9, 1946, Friedrich Paulus turned to the Soviet government with the following statement. Today, when the crimes of Hitler and his accomplices are brought before the peoples, I consider it my duty to provide the Soviet government with everything I know from my experience, which can serve as material in the Nuremberg trial to prove the war guilt of criminals. He further cited irrefutable evidence exposing the preparations by the Nazi government the Supreme Command and the General Staff of the Wehrmacht for a treacherous attack on the Soviet Union. He listed dozens of concrete facts incriminating Goering, Keitel and Jodl in unheard of crimes against humanity, against the peoples of the Soviet Union and other countries. Moreover, he did not try to evade justice, admitting his guilt. I personally bear a heavy responsibility at Stalingrad when I faithfully carried out the orders of military leaders who acted knowingly as criminals. As a Stalingrad survivor, I consider myself obligated to give satisfaction to the Russian people. Having sent this statement to the Soviet government, Paulus expressed his readiness to speak at the trial in Nuremberg and testify to the International Tribunal. He wrote, A duty to the German people prompted me. In the interests of the people, their rehabilitation, their future coexistence with other peoples in peace, it was necessary that a German witness testify before the International Tribunal in Nuremberg about this war of aggression, about the inhuman acts, such as the eradication of entire peoples of foreign countries, the robbery of populations in foreign territories, the concentration camps and the terrible consequences of this war. The appearance of former Field Marshal Paulus on February 11, 1946 as a witness in the courtroom of the International Tribunal in Nuremberg caused a terrible turmoil among the defendants sitting on the bench. Indeed, many of them believed Hitler's propaganda claiming that Paulus had committed suicide in Stalingrad. Soviet writer Boris Polevoy, who covered the trials as a correspondent for Pravda recalls, The English judge Geoffrey Lawrence, who is chairing the meeting, Orders the court's commandant, please introduce witness Friedrich Paulus. An oak-framed green door at the opposite end of the hall opens. A tall man comes in wearing a civilian suit that sits on him 
somehow, in a military way. Yet again, all present were dumbfounded. Flashes and clicks, recording cameras. Everyone watches with tension as Paulus rises to the witness stand. I don't know what he's thinking about, but outwardly he seems completely calm. But on the defendant's bench there is sheer panic. Goering is visibly annoyed. He shouts something at Hess who shrugs him off. Keitel and Yodel somehow curled up at looking inquiringly at the witness. He appeared here like a ghost rising from the Stalingrad ruins, bringing along the bitter memory of an army of 300,000 that perished on the banks of the Volga. With the same calm, Paulus puts his hand on the Bible and, raising two fingers of his right hand, says firmly, I swear to tell the truth, only the truth, nothing but the truth. Then he slowly begins to testify. We will repeat this oath after me. I swear by God, I swear by God, the Almighty and Omniscient, dem Allmächtigen und Allwissen, that I will speak the pure truth, dass hier eine Wahrheit sagen, and will withhold and add nothing, dass ich nichts verschweigen und nichts hinzusetzen werde. Would you like to sit down? <coughs> генерал фельдмаршал бывшей германской армии. Я воль. Ваша последняя должность командующий шестой армией под Сталинградом. Я воль. Скажите, господин свидетель, вы обратились 8 января 1946 года с заявлением в правительство Союза Советских Социалистических Республик. Я вольте, я пишки кем. Вы подтверждаете это заявление? Их пишите, где зи. Dry phrases that sound sharp, firm, and even as he speaks German and his words are clearly audible in the hall, many of the defendants for some reason put on headphones. Paulus speaks briefly and concisely. He clearly articulates phrases that he probably thought through well over the three years of his captivity. Telling about the criminal activities of the German general staff, he sometimes raises his eyes and looks at the defendants and those on whom he looks turn away, drumming nervously with their fingers on the barrier. Correspondents write and write, breaking pencils in their haste. Everything that Paulus speaks about is, to one degree or another, already known from the testimonies of other witnesses or from various documents. But to hear it from the field marshal confers a special authority on these words. And this man on the witness stand whom the Nazis secretly cursed, was like a ghost that rose again to expose before the court the German general staff as an obedient weapon in Hitler's hands. I remember what Paulus said about Jodl, speaking about Operation Barbarossa. You will see, gentlemen, how three weeks after the beginning of our offensive, this house of cards will collapse. I look at Jodl. Concentrating, he rolls a pencil on his stand, as if he was entirely into this occupation. Jodl's lawyer tried to get confirmation that the Nazi preparations for a military attack on the USSR were preventative in nature and were only a response to the military preparations of the USSR. But the former Field Marshal Paulus had the intention of telling only the truth. To the question of the Chief Prosecutor from the USSR, Rodenko, he answered, гитлеровским правительством и немецким верховным главнокомандованием вооруженного нападения на Советский Союз. Am 3. September 1940 trat ich meinen Dienst beim Oberkommando des Heeres an als Oberquartiermeister 1 des Generalstabes. 
Als solcher hatte ich den Chef des Generalstabes zu vertreten und im Übrigen die Aufträge im allgemeinen operativer Art, die er mir zuwies, zu erledigen. Bei meinem Dienstantritt fand ich in meinem Arbeitsbereich unter anderem eine noch unfertige operative Ausarbeitung vor, die einen Angriff auf die Sowjetunion behandelte. Diese operative Arbeit war ausgeführt worden von dem damaligen Generalmajor Marx, Chef des Generalstabes der 18. Armee, der zu diesem Zweck vorübergehend zum Oberkommando des Heeres kommandiert gewesen war. Der Generalstabschef des Heeres, Generaloberst Halder, wies mir die Weiterführung dieser aufgrund der Weisungen des Oberkommandos der Wehrmacht auszuführenden Arbeit zu. Colonel General Halder gave this plan to me with the task of analyzing the possibilities for offensive operations, taking into account the terrain conditions, the use of forces, the needs and resources, etc., for a total of 130 to 140 divisions. The goal in itself characterizes this plan as preparing pure aggression. This is also evident from the fact that defensive measures were not foreseen at all. As a result of Paulus' testimony, false claims about an allegedly preventative war were debunked. The former Wehrmacht Field Marshal clearly formulated the objective set by Nazi Germany in its attacking the Soviet Union. He emphasized, From June 22, 1941, we had set the course towards the destruction of the Soviet country. In Stalingrad on the Volga, this course reached its apogee. General Rudenko how would you define the objectives pursued by Germany in attacking Soviet Russia? Paulus, the general aim was to reach the Volga Archangel line, which was far beyond German strength and is in itself characteristic of Hitler's and the National Socialist leadership's boundless policy of conquest. From a strategic point of view, this would have meant the destruction of the armed forces of the Soviet Union and the conquest of Moscow as a main political objective. Economically, this would have meant the possession of most of the natural resources including the oil wells of the Caucasus and the main centers of production in Russia and also the main network of communications in European Russia. How much Hitler was bent on taking economic objectives in this war can best be shown from an example out of my personal experience. On the 1st of June 1942, at a conference of the Commanders-in-Chief of Army Group South at Poltava, Hitler declared, If I do not get the oil of Maikop and Grozny, then I must end this war. Economic and administrative organizations of the territories to be conquered had already been formed long before the beginning of the war. Our objectives supposed the conquest of the Russian territories for the purpose of colonization and the use of their resources in order to conclude the war in the West and achieve complete domination over Europe. General Odenko. And one last question. Whom do you consider as guilty of the criminal initiation of the war against Soviet Russia? Paulus. May I please have the question repeated? General Rodenko repeats the question. The President. The Tribunal thinks that such a question, as to who was guilty for the aggression upon Soviet territory, is one of the main questions which the Tribunal has to decide, and therefore is not a question upon which the witness ought to give his opinion. General Odenko, then perhaps the tribunal will allow me to put this question differently. The President, yes. General Odenko, who of the defendants was an active participant in the initiation of a war of aggression against the Soviet Union? Von den, 
von den Angeklagten, soweit sie in meinem Blickfeld lagen, die ersten militärischen Berater Hitlers, das ist der Chef des Oberkommandos der Wehrmacht Kaiser, der Chef des Wehrmachtsführungsamtes Jodel und Göring in seiner Eigenschaft als Reichsmarschall, als Oberbefehlshaber der Luftwaffe und als Bevollmächtigter auf den rüstungswirtschaftlichen Gebieten. The Chief of the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces, Keitel, the Chief of the Operations Department, Jodl, and Göring, in his capacity as Reichsmarschall, the Commander-in-Chief of the Air Forces, and as plenipotentiary for the armament economy. This was pronounced firmly, with conviction, looking directly into the eyes of his former colleagues. The testimony of Field Marshal Paulus, one of the masterminds behind Barbarossa, the war against the Soviet Union, was of great value. It revealed the vicious and predatory nature of Hitler's plans. The Secretary of the Soviet Delegation at the International Military Tribunal, A. I. Polterak, wrote, it is difficult for me to forget the confusion that enveloped the defence after that. Usually, the defendants were in a hurry to switch to cross-examination, if this gave them at least some chances. But this time, both the lawyers and the bench of the accused were seized by a kind of stupor. General Rodenko. In conclusion, have I rightly concluded from your testimony that long before 22nd of June, the Hitlerite government and the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces were planning an aggressive war against the Soviet Union for colonization purposes? Paulus. That is beyond doubt according to all the developments as I described them, and also in connection with all the directives issued. General Rodenko. I have no more questions, Mr. President. The President. Does any member of the French prosecution wish to ask any questions? French prosecutor. No. The President. The British? British prosecutor. No. The President. United States? United States prosecutor. No. The President. Any member of the Defendant's Council? After the Soviet prosecutor had finished, Judge Lawrence turned to the defence with a cross-examination proposal. But, as Polterak mentioned, Paulus' answer to the questions of General Rodenko had plunged the defendants into a complete confusion. Latanza rose from his seat. Turning to Lawrence, he asked, Mr. Chairman, I ask you to give the opportunity to raise questions for the witnesses tomorrow during the morning session. If uh, the prosecution has no objection, the tribunal thinks that this... But this break brought nothing to help the defence. Here began the cross-examination by defence attorneys Nelta, Latenza, Sauter, Exner, Horner and Fritz. Dieses noch einmal zu wiederholen, da ich äh, nicht erfasst habe, worauf diese Diktion hinausgeht. Es handelt sich hier um die Frage, wer die eigentlichen militärischen Sachbearbeiter des obersten Befehlshabers der Wehrmacht Hitler in großen Planungen waren. Dazu hatte Herr von Brauchitsch das gesagt, was Sie ja gehört haben, und Herr Halder hatte Folgendes gesagt. Militärische, fachliche Angelegenheiten oblagen der Verantwortung der dem Oberbefehlshaber der Wehrmacht unterstehenden Wehrmachtsteile das heißt dem Heer, Kriegsmarine und Luftwaffe. Ist das so?
Ich habe es erlebt, dass wir die Befehle über militärische Maßnahmen von dem Oberkommando der Wittmacht bekamen. Wie zum Beispiel auch diese Weisung Nummer 21. Ich habe als die Verantwortlichen der Arbeiter angesehen, die ersten militärischen Ratgeber Hitlers im Obkommando der Wehrmacht. Wenn Sie die Weisung 21 gesehen haben, dann wissen Sie auch, wer sie unterschrieben hat. Wer war das? Soweit mir erinnerlich, waren sie von Hitler unterschrieben, von Keitel und Jodel abgezeichnet. Was heißt, soweit, soweit mir erinnerlich? Hm. Aber jedenfalls von Hitler unterschrieben, wie alle Weisungen. Ist das richtig? Jedenfalls die meisten Weisungen, wenn sie nicht in seinem Namen durch andere Persönlichkeiten unterschrieben wurden. Nilter, Keitel's attorney. Yesterday, he said that no information was received from the intelligence service that would testify to the aggressive intention of the Soviet Union. Paulus, yes, that's right. Nelta, so you and Holder knew such facts that characterized the war against Russia as criminal and nevertheless did nothing against it. Paulus, yes. Nelta, knowing all these facts, did you take command of the army that was sent to Stalingrad? Tell me, did you have any thoughts then to cease being used for actions that you describe as criminal? Paulus, in connection with the situation that existed for soldiers then, as well as in connection with the colossal propaganda that took place at that time, I then, like many others, thought that I should fulfill my duty towards my homeland. Nota, but you were aware of facts that contradicted this notion of duty. Paulus, those facts that culminated in the Battle of Stalingrad only later became clear to me. As commander of Sixth Army, I did not realize that these were criminal acts since I had only a partial idea of the actual state of things. Nota, so I should consider your definition of criminal attack, as well as other definitions regarding the instigators of war, as notions that came to you later. Paulus, yes. Nelta, so we can say that, despite the doubts and despite your knowing the facts that made the war against Russia criminal, you considered it necessary to fulfill your duty out of sheer obedience assume the command of Sixth Army and fight at Stalingrad to the last man. Paulus, I have already said that when I took command I could not have imagined the scope of the crimes that followed as a consequence of this war. And I could not have had full knowledge of this, not until the army was already fighting at Stalingrad. Sauter, attorney for Schirach and Funk. Witness, you said yesterday that you also consider the Hitler government to be guilty. Is that correct? Paulus, yes. Exner, Jodl's attorney. Tell me, when you saw that the situation at Stalingrad was so hopeless and terrible as you just said, why didn't you act contrary to the orders of the Fuhrer and didn't try to break out of encirclement? Paulus, because then the case was presented to me in such a way that the fate of the German people depended on whether we continued fighting or not. Dr. Sauter, another question. After Stalingrad was encircled and the situation had become hopeless, there were several messages of devotion sent to Hitler from inside the fortress. Do you know anything about that? dass dies nicht kapitulieren als Beispiel für die Zukunft gelten möge. Die Antwort darauf 
war, glaube ich, Ihre Beförderung zum Generalfeldmarschall. Es ist mir nicht bekannt, dass das eine Antwort darauf war. Aber Sie, sind doch, Sie sind doch zum Generalfeldmarschall befördert worden und tragen auch diesen Titel, denn die Erklärung, die ich eben dem Gericht vorgelegt habe, ist unterzeichnet Paulus Generalfeldmarschall. Nee, dazu muss ich erklären, dass, welche diese Erklärung hier. Ja, diese Erklärung. Ja. Hier. Ja, ich muss ja die, den Titel nehmen, der mir verliehen worden ist. In dieser Erklärung die ich dem Gericht als Beweismittel vorgelegt habe, findet sich der Schlusssatz, ich trage die Verantwortung dafür, dass ich die Durchführung meines Befehles vom 14. Januar 1943 über Abgabe aller Kriegsgefangenen, das heißt aller russischen Kriegsgefangenen, Jawohl. an die russische Seite nicht überwacht habe. Und für die dadurch entstandenen Todesfälle, das heißt also auf russischer Seite, ferner, dass ich mich der Gefangenen fürsorge, also auch für die Gefangenen, russischen Gefangenen, nicht mehr gewidmet habe. Mir fällt auf, Herr Zeuche, und ich bitte mir darüber eine Erklärung abzugeben, warum haben Sie denn in diesem ausführlichen Schreiben die Hunderttausende von deutschen Soldaten ganz vergessen, die unter ihrem Oberbefehl standen und unter ihrem Oberbefehl Freiheit, Gesundheit und Leben verloren haben. Und kein Wort darum. Nein, nein. Darum handelte es sich in diesem Schreiben nicht. Dieses Schreiben an die Sowjetregierung setzte sich auseinander mit dem, was in dem Kessel von Stalingrad der russischen Zivilbevölkerung und den russischen Kriegsgefangenen angetan worden ist. An diesem Platze konnte ich für meine Soldaten hier nicht Nein, sprechen. Kein Wort für Nein, konnte ich hier nicht sprechen, sondern das... ...zum völkerrechtlicher Verträge durchgeführt werden. Es war mir ja klar, dass ein Überfall nur erfolgen konnte, und der Verletzung des Vertrages, der seit dem Herbst 39 in Sol mit Russland bestand. Denn in Verbindung mit dieser operativen Ausarbeitung eines Offensivplans, in dem wir auch schon von Anfang an mit der Ausnutzung des rumänischen Gebietes gerechnet wurde, in diese Zeit hinein fiel die erste Entsendung einer großen Militärmission mit Lehrtruppen, eine ganze Panzerdivision, gerade in dieses Gebiet, wofür die ersten theoretischen Vorarbeiten für einen Offensivplan gerade angelaufen Dr. Sauter, and that is why you continued your efforts in the crime you have described until the very end. Paulus, that is correct. Dr. Sauter, because according to your own statements, Everything from the very beginning was a crime which clearly and for a long time had come to your mind. Paulus, I did not say that it was clear to me as a crime from the very beginning, but that later I had this impression as a result of retrospective considerations. My knowledge comes actually from my experience at Stalingrad. Dr. Exner, do you know that you enjoyed the confidence of Hitler in a special measure? Paulus, I do not know about that. Dr. Exner, do you know that he had already decided that you would become the successor to Yodel if the Stalingrad operation had been successful because he did not like to work with Yodel anymore? Paulus, I do not know about that in this form, but there was a rumour that late in the summer or early fall of 1942 a change was planned in the leadership. That was a rumour which the Chief of Staff of the Luftwaffe told me at the time, but I did not get any official information about it. There was other information that I should be relieved of the command of that army and should be used to lead a new army group which was to be formed. Dr. Exner, do you remember the message which you sent to the Führer when you were promoted to the rank of Field Marshal at Stalingrad? 
Paulus, I did not send any message then. After my promotion, I did not send anything. Dr. Exner, have you not thanked the Führer in any way? Paulus, no. Dr. Latanza, I have only a few more questions to ask the witness. Witness, can you give information on how German prisoners of war were treated in the Soviet Union? Paulus, that question, about which such an incredible amount of propaganda has been made, and which led to the suicide of so many German officers in the Stalingrad cauldron, I have obligated myself to consider in the interests of truth. The President. One moment. Questions related to the treatment of prisoners in the Soviet Union have got nothing to do with any of the issues which we have got to try, and they are not relevant to the credibility of the witness. The tribunal, therefore, will not hear them. Dr. Latanza. Mr. President, may I give a reason why I ask that question? May I make a short statement? The President. Yes. Dr. Latanza. I should like to put that question for the reason that I could ascertain how, actually, prisoners of war were treated, so that a large number of German families who are extremely worried on that subject could in that manner to be given information on the subject so that their worries would cease. The President. The Tribunal is of the opinion that that is not a matter with which the Tribunal is concerned. Dr. Latianza. I have no further questions to ask the witness. Exner. Tell me, did you instruct a course at the Military Academy in Moscow? Paulus. No, I did not. Exner. Tell me, did you hold any position in Moscow? Paulus. I have never been in Russia before the war. Exner. And during your captivity? Paulus. I, like my other comrades, was in Russia as a prisoner of war. Exner. Tell me, are you a member of the Free Germany Committee? Paulus. I take part in the organization in which participate all those German civilians and officers who set out to save the German people from grave danger, from the grief that was brought upon them by Hitler's accomplices and to overthrow Hitler's government. To this I call the German people in my appeal of August the 8th, 1944. Fritz, Frisch's attorney. Witness, during this trial, the OKW ordered to shoot the Soviet Army Commissars made prisoner was mentioned. Were you aware of this order? Paulus, yes, I knew about it. Horn, Ribbentrop's attorney. Witness, you said you were a member of an organization that aimed to save the German people. Tell me, what opportunities did you have to realize this intention? Paulus, we had the opportunity to talk to the German people on the radio. We considered it our duty to explain everything to the German people, not only regarding the military, but also regarding the events of July 20, the plot against Hitler. This initiative came from the ranks of the army, which I led to Stalingrad where we saw that 100,000 German soldiers perish from the cold hunger and snow due to the orders of the state and military leadership. We met there in concentrated form with the horrors of a war of aggression. Horn. Was there a chance during your captivity to somehow provide your military knowledge and experience to the Soviet authorities? Paulus. Definitely not. Not to anyone. Paulus' testimony sounded like a gong in the ring, announcing a final KO for the Nazi defendants. Sources Nuremberg Trials T2S 611-620 A.I. Polterak Nuremberg Epilogue 1965 S509